name's Ruth. I'm a junior doctor from Melbourne and I've been helping Lahiru organize these lectures um, for the last year or so. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, so tonight we've got Dan. He's a junior doctor also from Melbourne um, in his second year out, interested in anesthetics, and he's going to be talking to us all about local anesthetics tonight. Um, so thank you so much, Dan, for volunteering your time. And for anyone who's, you know, interested in accessing more lectures, you know, we're going to try and run these on a monthly basis, you know, different pharmacology lectures, um, kind of clinical scenarios as well. So, you know, whether or not you're a medical student or a junior doctor, um, all really, really relevant as well. So just keep an eye out on all the socials um, for that as well. So, um, yeah, I'll hand over to Dan. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Ruth. All right, g'day everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, so last time we did a presentation was on ward calls for interns and that was a bit more chunky. So this one should be a bit more concise. I reckon it'll probably go for about 40, 45 minutes. And it's really just to cover basic things we should know as junior doctors, um, I guess on the wards for local anesthesia and just practical things that you'll be able to utilise. Um, if you need to use local anesthesia for any procedures, et cetera, when you're on the ward. It will go through some of the boring pharmacology and physiology, but it, it serves a good basis to be able to know how to you know, apply things clinically. So a little, bit, a little bit about me. I went to medical school at ANU initially in Canberra and then moved back towards um, Victoria with my family and resident at Western Health now, doing a mix of critical care and surgical rotation, so it should be quite fun. Um, as always, we got all of our resources on all of our platforms. We have the podcasts, YouTube um, sites. We got the ABCs of anesthesia that has all the kind of um, all the courses and information on there as well. Um, and we got all of our usual social media that we keep things updated regularly. So you know, have a pop on then, and and yeah, if you ever need any information, there's a plethora of stuff there. And yeah, for this presentation, it'd be great if we could, um, you know, make it interactive. At, towards the later part, so I can always, um, I'll ask a few questions. If you can put your cameras on, that'd be great. Um, doesn't matter what the answers are, really. We're all just all here to learn, and we'll go through, um, go through everything together. So going into the presentation now. So I guess the objective is we'll just go through some definitions and classifications of local anesthetic agents. Um, then go into some basic pharmacology and physiology, really just like we won't go into the nitty gritty, but really just for a basic understanding and then to be able to transfer that into kind of clinical applications. Then some cr common preparations that we'll find on the ward, some simple LA techniques that we'll be able to utilise and some um, common adverse effects and complications that we should know. So just going a little bit into the history just for interest sake. So. Um, in about 2500 BC, basically they found out that physically compressing limbs approximately would produce a numbing sensation distally. So this is essentially analogous to a regional block and it kind of gave rise, I guess, to the notion of nerve conduction. Um, then Plato and Aristotle, they basically described using electric shocks from electric rayfish and they would found that it produced like a local numbing effect. So they would use it to... Um, reduce pain from conditions like such as headaches and gout, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't until a little bit later in about the 1880s that Sigmund Freud experiments with cocaine on himself. Um, he noted um, the numbing effects on his tongue, um, but obviously there were stimulant effects as well. Um, and so he recommended it to be used by one of his colleagues um, who was in ocular surgery and he found that it was quite effective. Um, but it wasn't until the early 1900s where then they um, added in a vasoconstrictor, which was adrenaline, and that essentially helped to limit the systemic toxicity of um, of the local anaesthetic and uh, limit it to just a, its local effect. And then soon after, then there was essentially a plethora of um, of discovery. So the first, I guess, the major bake breakthrough was um, lignocaine. It was the first non ester based LA that they made in 1949 had significant fewer side effects um, than ester-based LAs, which we'll go through the classification soon. And then subsequently, they they basically manufactured other, other LAs, um, bupivacaine, bupivacaine, et cetera, some of the ones that you'll see or would have heard of in theatre. So going into the definitions now, um, I guess it's good to distinguish between analgesia and anesthesia. So Anesthesia is the loss of all sensation, so it's pain but also touch and proprioception. 
uh, whereas analgesia is a loss of pain. And this is really what we're aiming for. I know we always say like LA, local anesthesia, but we're really essentially uh, aiming for analgesia. Um, and so it's really is important when you're describing LA to patients that you explain to them that you may still feel pushing and pressure. Um, those kind of sensations are normal, but the aim is to get rid of um, pain. And if you don't describe that, it can basically set the wrong expectations. And patients, if they feel some pushing and pressure, they think that the LA hasn't actually worked, um, or in fact it has. It's just removed the painful sensation. So that kind of goes into that definition of pain, which you've probably all read before. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. Um, so it kind of highlights optimizing those non-pharmacological things, optimizing emotions and expectations, and that all, that all goes into LA technique as well. And then looking at, so what are we actually trying to achieve when we give a local anest anesthetic? So we want to block neuronal signals reversibly. Um, we want to block the sensation of pain, as I just mentioned, not necessarily the other sensations, so pressure, um, proprioception. We're not really trying to block those things. And as a secondary thing, we also want to get hemostasis to help with the operative field by the vasoconstrictors. That helps with bleeding, so it reduces bleeding, but it also helps reduce um, systemic absorption and thus toxicity of the LA. And also because of the vasoconstriction and limiting the systemic absorption, it helps prolong the action of the LA by keeping it localized. So that improves like um, the working conditions of the LA, but also again reduces the amount of LA we need to use and thus the systemic toxicity. And going into the broad classification of LA, so essentially LA agents are really classified by the intermediate chain. So the general structure of LA, you have the lipophilic part, an aromatic ring on the left-hand side. Then you have this intermediate chain, and then you have the hydrophilic part. The hydrophilic part through its hydrogenation essentially is the on and off switch. It dictates whether the LA is in like a lipid or a water-soluble species, which will is important for the LA to be able to diffuse through the cell membrane, which we will go through a little bit later on as well. But that intermediate chain is really key for that classification of LA, and it's then classified as an amide, or as an ester. The ester are the older LA agents and the amide are essentially the newer LA agents, although we still use both, but amides are used more commonly nowadays. So going into ester agents, so they're things like cocaine, procaine, and methacaine. A good way to remember them is that they have one I in their name. Um, they have a shorter duration of action, um, and that's probably because they're hydrolyzed in the plasma by plasma colonesterase, and so they're quite readily broken down. They are broken down into something called para-aminobenzoic acid, PABA, which can be allergenic. So they have a higher rate of allergic reactions than amide agents. Um, and also related to this breakdown um, and their breakdown by plasma colonesterase is that if the patient has a condition called pseudocolonesterase um, deficiency, it can impair the metabolism of um, the LA agent and therefore cause increased risk of toxicity and adverse effects. Because it is really, really broken down, it does also have a shorter half-life. Then going into amide agents, so these have two eyes. So you've got lignocaine, prilocaine, um, rapivacaine, et cetera. Um, they're, they're actually broken down by the liver enzyme rather than by the plasma colonesterase. So they have um, – this is a slower process than S's, so, that they, so they, therefore they have longer action, longer shelf life. Um but there is a high risk of systemic toxicity due to that slow metabolism. So if you use too much of it, you can obviously cause an overdose. The good thing about them is that because they're not broken down into, the, into that PABA product, there's almost no allergic reaction to the actual LA. You can still get allergic reactions to the additives in the solution. So they put things like antiseptics, like methylparaben in the actual little you know, LA solutions that you see. Um, you can get allergic reactions to them, but a true allergic reaction to the actual LA agent is um, almost nil, essentially, for amide agents. Then going a bit now into the pharmacology and um, physiology. So I won't go too much in the neuron structure, but essentially you have a lipid bilayer like in your cell membrane and you have a membrane potential that's regulated by voltage-gated ion channels. The main ones that are important to know are sodium and potassium. The, essentially, the target for LA is that sodium channel. That's key for, um, for LA agents. And what happens is that the 
LA essentially diffuses into the neuron, into the intracellular area. And from that intracellular space, LA will bind to that um, SOM channel, inhibit um, the permeability of sodium ions coming through and therefore stop depolarization and stop an action potential from occurring and stopping that neuron from firing. Um, so then essential to this process is actually getting the LA from the extracellular space into the intracellular space because you're injecting it into the extracellular space. So the way LAs are prepared, them, LA themselves are weakly basic compounds. So you can see that's denoted as the B. And they combine readily with um, hydrogen ions in solution to form BH+. So that's LA, That's your LA salts. And obviously that's a charged species. That can't cross the cell membrane. So when you inject it into the extracellular space, a portion will dissociate into that hydrogen ion and into B, the weakly basic acidic compound. That is an uncharged species which can then diffuse across the cell membrane. Then in the intracellular space, it can bind again with with uh, the um, H plus form your charged species, and that charged species is, up, is what will then act on the sodium channel to to close it and to stop that um sodium um, permeability, and that will yeah, inhibit depolarization. There's a few things that are key to that diffusion of that LA salt extracellularly into that um, unionized form, and it's essentially related to the pKa. Um, the acid dissociation constant of the acid as well as the pH of that surrounding tissue, which we'll go through now. So this is an important clinical concept. So, yeah, pKa is your acid dissociation constant. And essentially a lower pKa of an LA or of any, of any compound, it means more. It has a, there's more unionized um, particles, which means there's more that's going to be able to diffuse across the cell membrane, so it's a faster onset of action. And essentially, um, with your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, basically, if your pH and your pKa are equal at that point in time, fifty percent of your um, of your LA is going to be charged, and fifty percent is going to be in the uncharged form. And that's kind of the optimal ratio, where then you can get fifty percent of those um, uncharged acidic molecules crossing the cell the cell membrane. So. I guess, what does that mean? It means that if the pH of the extracellular space is around 7.4, usually, the lower the pKa of your um, LA, the closer it is to 7.4, the more that's going to be able to diffuse through and the faster the onset of action. So pKa's of LA's range between about 7.7 .7 and 8.1. So if you have something like lignocaine, which has a low pKa around 7.8, that's a bit closer to 7.4. So that actually has a faster onset of action than something like bupivacaine, which has a pKa of 8.1, which is a bit higher um, yeah, than lignocaine. It's also the other, so that's the pKa. The other um, thing in this equation is the pH of the tissue. So obviously the lower, the more acidic the pH of the tissue, the far that discrepancy between the pH and the pKa, and the more difficult the LA is going to be, um, the, the less effective the LA will be. So if you have um, like abscesses, significant wounds or traumas, that inflammation in that area will actually make the tissue more acidic and it'll be harder for the LA to work because less of it's going to dissociate into that unionized form. So if that is the case, then you would perhaps consider utilizing a regional block, injecting the LA solution proximal from that area, from that abscess, where the tissue is normal and where the LA is going to be able to act, act uh, more effectively. Within all this concept is also the use of sodium bicarb um, and essentially exploits this pKa and pH um, equation that we're talking about. Um, when you actually make LA solutions, when they manufacture it, those little vials, the pH is around 3.5 to 5.5, so they're actually quite acidic, the vials of LA. And they do it like this because they want to make sure that a lot of the uh, LA is bound up to acid, so it's in its charged form, so it can't precipitate out because um, otherwise it will degrade and the shelf life will be really, really poor. So they make them acidic on purpose. Um, but, for instance, in epidural top ups where we want them to work really, really quickly, what we can do is in those little LA vials, we can quickly just mix it with some sodium bicarb, pop up that pH up a little bit higher towards the, the, um, towards like the 7.4, 7.5 level, and now that the pK and the pH is really, really close, you're going to have more of those uncharged um, LA, uh, LA um, bases, 
which can then diffuse through. So that's another reason why, um, yeah, we use sodium bicarbonate epidural top-ups. That's kind of a pretty meaty discussion. Does anyone have any questions about that before we go to the next thing? Beautiful. All right, so we'll go to um, this question. I was actually wanting to put this out to the audience potentially. So we've talked about PKA and pH. Does anyone want to listen to some other factors that influence or talk about some other factors that influence the speed of LA onset? And there's a hint there that there's an equation there that anyone can yell out potentially or write in the chat. Any takers? That's all right. Oh, um, so essentially that's fixed law of diffusion going way back into physiology and pharmacology in undergrad. So the so these essentially, th th this diffusion um, equation essentially will describe how quickly any kind of gas or liquid, um, how quickly it will work. So it's pertinent to LA as well. So membrane area is directly proportional to membrane area. So the larger the area that you're going to be um, injecting solution into, if you inject more of it, it's going to cover a larger surface area, so more of it's going to diffuse through. It's inversely proportional to membrane thickness, which, again, just makes sense. It's intuitive. Directly proportional to solubility, which is related to the pKa, which is what we just spoke about. So that's the, really the major influencing factor. Then inversely proportional to molecular weight, which is really a minor factor because most LAs have a very similar molecular weight. And then directly proportional to your concentration gradient, which is important because obviously it makes sense that you know a 2% Lignocaine is going to be have a faster onset of action than one percent lignocaine because your concentration gradient is greater. It's going to be diffusing quicker across the um, the neurone cell membrane. So going to common things you'll see in the ward in you know Australia, um, so like Victoria and Canberra where I've practiced, um, the common ones I've seen are really these three. So. Lignocaine is your bread and butter. You'll be using it so much on the ward and, and in ED. You can see it in 1% or 2% preparations with or without adrenaline. That's important because your maximum dosage will change with or without adrenaline. So plain solutions, 3 milligrams per kilogram is your maximum dosage. Um, with adrenaline, it's 7 milligrams per kilogram. So it significantly increases the amount you can use. Duration of action is about 2 to 4 hours. Um, and as a practical note, it's very safe. You'll use it very commonly on the ward and it's essentially a go-to to like um, using for LA for like suturing and that kind of stuff. Rapivacaine is another one you'll see and it's tend to be, it, it's tend to, like they tend to use it because it has a longer duration of action, about four to 12 hours. Um, and sometimes I've seen it mixed with lignocaine, for instance. So you get that fast onset of action of lignocaine and the longer onset of action of rapivacaine. Yeah, and its main practicality is that, yeah, you get a longer duration of action. And then bupivacaine is also one that's seen that I've seen quite a fair bit, particularly in theatre. Um, for instance, in um, in jaw fractures and wisdom teeth surgery and stuff, they'll use bupivacaine. Um, again, because it has quite a long um, duration of action, um, yeah, it's it's quite ideal to be using those scenarios. The plain dose, the plain um, maximum dosage for the plain solution is two milligrams per kilogram for that. And with adrenaline, I've seen it vary between 2.5 to 3 milligrams, but I think 2.5 milligrams per kilogram is probably a safe one for bupivacaine with adrenaline. And then just another note on adrenaline, sometimes you'll see, uh, it's actually very commonly in theatre that, you know, some of the surgeons will want to use more lignocaine with adrenaline, but purely for that vasoconstrictive action rather than the need for more LA. So they'll just want it because it's pre-mixed with adrenaline, you can inject it in and just causes some vasoconstriction and it clears the operative field. But we don't always have to use the premixed solutions. And it essentially, by making just a diluted adrenaline solution, it avoids using, you know, unnecessarily using LA and overdosing potentially. So Lahiri has a really nice video on YouTube describing this. But just to summarize it, essentially, if you get one of the small adrenaline ampules, so your, um, your one mil adrenaline ampules, you can get. 0.1 mil of that, so that's 100 mics. Or if you have the bigger adrenaline ampules, your 10 mil ones, you can get one mil of that. It's, again, 100 mics. And if you mix those with 20 mil of normal saline, essentially you're creating a 1 in 200,000 adrenaline solution. Um, and you can use that 
um, as a VEDA contributive agent. So, yeah, I think the easiest way really is just to get one of those really small, yeah, one mil ampules, take out 0.1 mil, mix it with 20 mil of normal saline, and now you've got, you know, one in 200,000 adrenaline solution, and it saves you having to use some pre-mixed, you know, LA with adrenaline. So that's just a handy tip. And now going into overall principles of LA te technique. So what do we, how do we actually do, do it? There's kind of two broad principles, an infiltration versus a, a nerve block. So an infiltration is essentially what it said, what the name suggests. You infiltrate the LA exactly where you want it. So you've got a wound, you infiltrate the LA exactly where you want it, and it numbs up that area. So it locally anesthetizes that area. A regional nerve block is when you anesthetize the nerve more proximally, and then everything distal to that is essentially anesthetized because it blocks the rest of the nerve from firing. That's ideal for when you need a wider field of, field of anesthesia or if you can't do a local infiltration for whatever reason, for instance, a massive abscess where the LA isn't going to work very, very well. You'll see it commonly used in ED for things like digital nerve blocks. You'll see it used, you know, after major surgeries by um, the anesthetist for pain, for, for adequate pain management. You'll even see it done intraoperatively operatively sometimes as well. Can be done blind or it can be done ultrasound, just depends on where you're doing it. You know, digital nerve blocks, you, you would just be doing that blind essentially. Um, but some of the more fancy ones, um, you'll be using um, image guided um, regional nerve blocks. And then for the local infiltration, so that's the simple one where you just infiltrate where you want to numb it up for a wound. Again, broken down to two, two separate kind of techniques, I would say is either through the wound. So do you just, do you see, if you see picture A, do you anesthetize the wound directly through the wound um, edges or around the wound? And I guess, I think a lot of this is theoretical. Um, through the wound, I guess the the pros, I think is that it's very simple. Uh, it's probably less painful because you avoid piercing the skin, which is where the concentration of nociceptors is greatest. That's the most painful part of giving LA is piercing the skin. So it's, I think it is less painful, but the theoretical negative is that, is that if the wound edges are very, very contaminated and dirty, um, theoretically, I guess you can cause iatrogenic spread of bacteria and, and across tissue planes and cause worsening infection. I'm not sure if there's any actual research uh, on that. Um, but postoperatively, you'll see the surgeons use it a lot. After they made their incision postoperatively, they'll do, you know, they'll just anesthetize through the wound. It's very, very simple. You essentially just insert the needle through the wound edges around the middle of the wound, aspirate so you're going to make sure you're not in the blood vessel, and then slowly inject. And then you withdraw the needle slightly, but don't pull it all the way out. So you withdraw the needle, then redirect it proximally or distally, again, aspirate and eject until you've done, you've fanned across the whole wound edge. And then you just repeat the same thing on the other side. Um, for around the wound, I guess the benefit is that you're inserting the needle through clean, intact skin rather than through, you know, potentially contaminated wound edges. But the negative is that you need multiple injections to do it. Um, and essentially what you do is, so at the base of the wound, you, um, after you've cleaned around thoroughly, et cetera, at the base of the wound, um, you'll do your first injection where you just inject a little bleb of, anis of, of, of LA and you'll see a little bleb of the skin. Um, so you know that that skin now is numb, so it shouldn't be too painful after that. And then you um, insert your needle. Sorry, sorry, I just skipped that one. You insert your needle a little bit um, further, and you go through that subcutaneous tissue plane until you've gone almost to the hub of the needle. Then you can aspirate, make sure you're not in a vessel, and then slowly inject as you withdraw the needle out. So then you get that whole length of needle, that tissue, all anesthetized. And then you insert the needle again into the most distal part of, of the tissue that you've anesthetized to make sure it's numb. Insert the needle and then flatten the angle and then go through that subcutaneous plane and keep doing that essentially until you go all the way around the wound and the whole area is numb. So you can see that's going to take you know, a fair bit longer. It might be a bit more um, technically challenging because you've got to keep you know taking the needle out, injecting a bit, uh, inserting the needle in through the skin a bit further down, and you might miss the area where it's actually numb and then it might be sore for the patient. Um, but I guess, yeah, th theoretically, you're, you're avoiding that contamination of the wound edges if you go through that through that method. I've seen both used. Um, yeah, I think you can use both completely fine. Um, and then some other practicalities um, about LA. So again, before injection, 
Make sure you're setting expectations. So, you know, after the LA is done, you might feel some pressure, but it shouldn't be painful. We'll make sure we'll test it to make sure that you don't have any pain. Um, you can consider some topical anesthesia, really useful in the pediatric population. So I did a pediatric ED term last year, and we basically, if we knew that we we're going to have to, you know, do a, um, a numb up for whatever reason, if there's a laceration or something like that, we just pop on some pop on some Emla cream. It's a five percent topical cream. Leave that on for 40, 45 minutes. Come back, nice and numb, and then you can um, you can kind of give LA a lot more simpler. Important to hold the skin taut, and that just allows the needle to pierce easier. And it's important because the skin is where, again, it's more, most painful when you first inject. Similar to when you put a cannula in, you know, if the skin, if you don't hold the skin taut and, you know, fix the skin and the vein, um, you know, distally, it can make it quite difficult and more painful when you're inserting the needle through the skin. Inject slowly. Um, that's important because tissue distension, the stretch will then activate all the nociceptors in the skin. So injecting uh, slowly avoids that distension or minimizes it. And then distracting techniques is really important. So, you know, saying things like, well, just focus on your breathing, wiggle your toes, count the months of the year backward, all these things help um, and it's quite useful to use. And really important to aspirate because you want to avoid an intravascular injection, um, which greatly increases the risk of an overdose. And then after injecting, the go-to that I say is uh, I, just, um, I basically get either the needle tip or some tooth forceps if I have some ready. And I first say, um, you know, can you feel me touching? Can you feel any pushing or pressure or anything? And I'll say yes or no. And if they do feel me touching, I say, oh, does it feel sharp or is it actually painful or does it just feel like pushing and pressure? And most of the time they'll say, oh, it's just pushing and pressure, which is perfectly fine. If it's still sharp, you either need, need to wait a little bit longer for the LA to work or you just need to pop some more in. And then going into complications and adverse effects. So I might just ask someone, sorry to put people on stand. I might ask someone, is there any way that you'd think how to classify like systematically complications of LA, potentially Nariel Garcia? I've got no clue, sorry. That's all right. Thanks for thanks for popping the, the thing on though. Um yeah, that's completely fine. So I guess the way to classify it broadly is you can think systemic. So systemic are things like overdose, vasovagals, which are faints essentially, or allergies. Then you can think about local. So you've got systemic, then local. Local is pain, injury to surrounding structures, spread of infection, ischemia of extremities, which is really important. So you shouldn't use LA with adrenaline in your, you know, in your you know, extremities. So fingers, toes, ears, nose. Um, needle breakage, theoretically, I guess I haven't seen it done before. And then needle stick injuries, obviously. And then a failure of anesthesia. So missing the nerve in a block is, you know, quite obvious for a reason why it won't work. I, the intravascular, intramuscular injections, which is why for intravascular, it's really important to aspirate before you inject. Poor effectiveness in inflamed regions, which relates to the pH and the pKa, which we spoke about before. And the patient perception, which again is what we spoke about before. So yeah, patients might be thinking that, you know, you should be get essentially feeling nothing, including um, not feeling pressure, which simply isn't the case. So that's kind of how you broadly classify the complications of LA. We won't go through all of these. An important one is LA overdose. So this one the the symptoms of LA overdose it's it's um they're, like essentially it's there's two there's two separate phases there's an excitation phase and then a depressive phase and the excitation phase occurs first so essentially initially if someone is getting signs or symptoms of LA overdose they might be getting some they might start to get becoming agitated they may be twitching might have difficult difficulty focusing they might be confused their heart rate might be going up, their respiration will be increased, they might start to get like um, uh, numbness and tingling around the mouth, around the extremity. So this is all kind of like an increase in symptoms, so hence the excitation phase. Afterwards, when you're starting to get, you know, quite bad and it's really starting to, you're really starting to overdose, this is then the depressive phase. So you start to go into respiratory arrest, it starts to become very lethargic, very drowsy, may become unresponsive. And then eventually from it will go to respiratory arrest and then cardiac arrest. So that's kind of, yeah, those two phases, excitation initially and then the depressive phase. 
the factors which influence whether someone's going to overdose is so the drug factor, so that obviously the dose and concentration that we use. Within that as well as whether we use adrenaline or not, the route of injection, IV, the use of azoconstrictor, which I've just said, the use of adrenaline, and then also patient factors, so their age, their weights, whether they have hepatic or renal disease, which will impair excretion um, and metabolism of the LA agent, pseudocholinesterase deficiency, which we spoke about, the esters, inhibits the breakdown of it. Um and then, so they're the two main factors, so drug factors and patient factors. And then we talked about the clinical features, which are the excitation phase and then the depressive phase. So to actually manage an LA overdose, it's really going back into your A, B, C, D, E approach, having a systematic kind of fallback going through um, uh, any complications is really, really important. So the A, B, C, D approach is tried and tested. Um, very useful, and you also use it, yeah, in LA overdoses. So first thing you'll do is, you know, stop the infiltration or infusion, obviously, call for help, and then go through your ABCDEs. So airways, basic airway maneuvers, plus minus adjuncts. If someone's in that excitation phase, they may not need any airway maneuvers. They might be maintaining their own airway. But obviously, if they start to get to that depressive phase, then this becomes a lot more important. Breathing, having monitoring on and supplemental oxygen if you need. If they're desaturating, circulation, having IV access and fluid running because they can get into that, they start to go into the depressive phase, cardiovascular collapse is something that can occur. Ongoing cardiac monitoring, and obviously if there's no signs of life, you'll be going down the CPR route. Within circulation is also a useful um, drug is IV intralipid, and this is really reserved for very severe toxicity. To be honest, I've done a decent amount of research on this and there's not a straight answer as to how this works. The most accepted theory is that it creates what's called a lipid sink and this lipid sink essentially draws the, the, the drug from the tissue into the lipid phase and when it's in that lipid phase, it can essentially no longer exert its pharmacological action. That's the theory of how it works, but it's usually only reserved for, for um, severe toxicity. Um, and then your, your D for disability, so monitoring your GCS, checking your BGL. Within this as well is that you can get convulsions and seizures um, in the LA overdose, so you may need to consider um, giving anti-epileptics if a seizure occurs. An important differential, though, for an LA overdose is a vasovagal syncope. So someone may be feeling lightheaded, maybe getting visual and auditory disturbances. They may be getting some you know, perioral numbness. These can sometimes, you know, be signs, symptoms of a, of a syncopal episode as well. So a simple thing you can do is if they start to get some of these signs and symptoms after directly after giving LA, lie them down first, raise their legs, essentially get the blood back to the brain, and if it reverses quite quickly, then you know it's a vasovagal, perfect. That's easy to manage. If it's not reversing, it's not getting better, then possibly need to think about an overdose. And going into vasovagal syncope. So this is another very common complication of LA. Um, I guess the, the pathophysiology of vasovagal syncope is essentially, in a nutshell, you have this a reflex mediated by the autonomic nervous system. You get a simultaneous enhancement of, the, of your parasympathetic tone and a decrease in your sympathetic tone. So the net result of that is you get you know reduced heart rate and contractility, widespread vasodilation, essentially get a reduced cardiac output. And that means you're getting less blood to your brain and then you become confused, dizzy, and you faint. Um, the presentation is, yeah, as a, the symptoms, nausea, dizziness, lightheadedness. Some people describe tunnel vision. Some people can get quite anxious and sweaty. Uh, and the signs are those things, pal um, perspiration, restlessness, um, palpitations um, initially, but then they might become bradycardic and hypotensive when the parasympathetic fires a lot more and the sympathetic goes down. The management is quite simple. So you just lie the patient flat, raise their legs. If you can, put them in Trendelenburg, which essentially does the same thing. And it's just getting the blood back to the brain. And, you know, nine times out of 10, that essentially fixes the situation. You just need to give it, you know, about a minute or so and they start to feel better. For people that are very, very bradycardic or not responding, you can use atropine, but I've never seen this need to be used. Um, usually just simple management, lying them down, raising their legs, getting them to move their legs around um, 
is enough to, to fix the situation. And I think that concludes our presentation. Before I go to the um, summary, are there any questions about any of that? Happy to answer anything, or if you want to type in anything in the chat, we can also answer there. So to summarise, analgesia versus anaesthesia, the importance of setting expectation um, for our patients. AMIs for esters, so the main classification difference being that intermediate chain. Infiltrations versus blocks. Blocks, so infiltrations are good for wounds. Blocks are, you know, when you need a wider field of anesthesia or you can't do a local infiltration for whatever reason. Then maximum doses with and without adrenaline. That's just something you essentially have to rote learn or you have on your lanyard or something because, yeah, that's just something you've got to memorise. Um, but just pick two or three that you're going to use commonly and just know those ones. The rest you can just look up if you really need to. And then the management of an LA overdose, which is, quite important so calling for help early using an a b c d e approach and then really thinking about a vasovagal syncope as a um a very common differential for a la overdose so essentially the actual pa solutions the ph of the actual la solutions themselves when they're manufacturing the vial they're made as an acidic solution so around 3.5 to 5.5 is the ph that they make them in and they do that on purpose because they want a lot of this, um, I wonder if I can have a, can you guys see my laser pointer? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, cool. So they do that because they want the LA to be bound up in this form here so that it doesn't precipitate out in the actual vials um, and then degrade and decrease the shelf life. So the LA solutions are made quite acidic. Obviously, that's not very advantageous when you actually inject it because you're not going to have much of this one here, B, which is what you actually need for it to diffuse across the cell membrane. So what you can do is you can mix some of those LA vials of solution with sodium bicarb, which is obviously has a very high alkaline pH. And that essentially raises the pH of the solution up. So it's, you know, a lot more like around the seven to eight mark. And because it's a lot more alkaline, you get more of this um, uh, breaking down into B and then H plus, so you've got more unionized base now available, and so that when you inject it into the extracellular space, you've got more of this ready to go and to diffuse across the cell membrane straight away. So they do that because they want the epidural top-ups to work quite quickly. So And because now you're, you're going to be using the LA then and there, so you don't really care about you know the shelf life of the LA anymore. You just want to get as much of it into this form here. So they so they prepare it with sodium bicarb, get it get all of this shifting across into this unionized form. And so then yeah, when you inject it into the epidural space, all this is ready to go to diffuse across the neuronal cell membrane. Does that make sense? It's a bit of a hard concept to explain, but awesome, cool, cool. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.